He is risen. No, you're supposed to say he is risen indeed. Shall we try it again? <laughs> he is risen. He is risen Amen. Praise God. Oh, this is a real delight, and uh, I feel absolutely at home with this motley crew. <laughs> so I fit in perfectly, I think. <laughs> but this isn't the first time I've spoken to the church here at Shirley, but I'd be very surprised if uh, anyone here who remembers it. Because the last time I spoke to the church at Shirley was over 50 years ago. How about that? Anybody here remember? No. <laughs> if one hand goes up. <laughs> yeah, 50 years ago. Wonderful. But you've obviously forgiven me or forgotten what I said, so I've been invited back. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it really is lovely to be here. That um, when in the 1960s, I was actually the pastor of the Full Gospel Tabernacle in um, Yardleywood Road. And uh, I knew then uh, the Bowwaters pretty well and Chris and folks. And we had an old lady in the church at the, at the Tabernacle. And she was in her 90s, Mrs. Warner. Anybody here who would know Mrs. Warner? Okay, yes, some, yes, some of the old tab people there would knew Mrs. Warner. <clears throat> she was, a, she was a, a, an old Swiss lady with a, she'd been in this country for about 60 years, I think, but a, it was still kind of broken English. But she had come to the Lord in the revival crusades of the Jeffreys brothers in Birmingham. Some of you who know your history may know of that period of time when God was moving powerfully in Birmingham. And she came to the Lord and was filled with the Spirit, and she was a, a fascinating old lady, um, soft and gentle and with a spine of steel. She was a determined lady. But she became old, and uh, Jeff and Winnie invited her because they, perhaps, perhaps people don't know the history here, but if my understanding is right, the work in Shirley actually began as a Sunday school extension from the tabernacle all those years ago. Um, and uh, Jeff and Winnie and Peter Jackson, of course, uh, were here at that time. And uh, there was a, always a great kind of musical something about um, Shirley, evangelical church as it was then. Um, so they invited Mrs. Warner to go and stay with them. And uh, I used to go and see her from time to time. And they were always very warm and welcoming me. And through some of my deepest trials, they were great friends to me. So I'm... Um, I really am glad to be back. It's, it's a wonderful blessing. Okay. Well, I, I like to listen to what's happening in a meeting because I do believe that preaching isn't a performance with spectators. I, I really believe in body ministry and I believe that God brings a word which will be received and the receiving of it will actually draw other things out. In the words, so I'm looking forward to you receiving what's being said, and uh, that God will bless us as we do these things together. Uh, I want to read a passage of scripture to you first of all. This is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and I'm going to read a few of these. First verses. So please turn with me. My version of the scriptures may diff be different to yours, but you'll, you'll kind of link it together, I'm sure. This is interesting because Paul was writing this probably about 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that kind of brings me really, I suppose, to one of my first questions. Uh, here we are singing about death and resurrection, but it's a long, long time ago, isn't it? A long, long time ago. It's over 2,000 years ago. So what's that got to do with me? What relevance does that have to me? Or if we were being very cruel, we might say, well, interesting. But even if I believe it, so what? But it wasn't just a demonstration of God's love. It wasn't just showing what God was like. It was with a purpose. Uh, he, he, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not just to demonstrate his love, but so that those who believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And Paul, who was not one of the original apostles, was a man who had his own experience of Christ and his own experience of the Spirit of God. 
And he writes not just academic things, not just historical facts, but he writes something which is deep in his heart and which is as important to him the day he wrote this as when he first embraced the gospel. It's a wonderful thing. You see, I remember reading some years ago, I was reading a history book, and the person who was reading this book was talking about history and the way that history is written. And he made this statement and he said, you have to have a sense of loss to really appreciate history. And I thought, well, that's a profound statement. And I thought about it. I thought, yes, I think it is true. You know, when you move away from somewhere which has been your home for a long time and you think back, you, you th usually think about the good things, maybe some of the sad things as well, but you think, yes, it's a sense of loss. And then as I thought, I thought, now this is really remarkable because I have absolutely no sense of loss about the historical death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the letter to the Hebrews, the writer says, it was through the eternal spirit that he offered himself for that spot to God. And there's some mysterious way in which what Jesus Christ did on the cross was captured in eternity. If you, this won't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense to me, so it won't make any sense to you. But somehow Calvary was an eternal moment. And so was the resurrection moment. They've not grown old. In the spirit, in the eternal spirit in which he gave his life, they're as living, as vibrant, as potent now as they were the moment they happen. It's an amazing thing. And I come back to these scriptures again and again and again and feel the power of them, feel the throb of them. When John had his vision in the thing that we call the book of the Revelation, he gives a description of something he saw. He sees a throne and initially he sees someone sitting on the throne and there's a book in his hand, a scroll that's sealed with seven seals and they, uh, no one can open it because no one is worthy. And then John is told to come, because John's weeping, and to look. And behold, he says, come and see the line of the true tribe of Judah. And John comes, no doubt, expecting to see a warrior. That's a lion, isn't it? That's the king of the jungle. That's this great roaring beast with nobody stands in front of a lion. And he looks and he sees a lamb. As it had been slain, standing he sees a lamb that has passed through death. It's been slain, but it's standing. He's seeing the resurrection Christ. I hope this won't offend you, but if you like, with the wounds still fresh upon him. That moment is now. It's not then. It is then, and it's now. It's both. We've got two different timelines here. And things are true in eternity and if the Spirit of God gives us access to those things, they can be true now, even though they happened 2,000 years ago. When I survey the wondrous cross, am I looking backwards? No, I'm looking upwards. Because these things are eternally true. And they have eternal power with them. So Paul, 30 years after the end, writes this letter to the Ephesians. And here are the first few verses. I'll read them. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Usually when I go to places that I haven't been before, and actually even to the place where I'm at home in Bracknell, I, I usually begin by saying, good morning, saints. And it, it isn't a kind of, you know, it, it isn't a kind of a catchword like you have it. It's something that I believe passionately. What does saints mean? Well, maybe you think it means somebody in a stained glass window who did some very holy things and people kind of still remember. But when the Bible talks about saints like this, it's really meaning people who belong to Jesus Christ. Because saint really has to do with people who have been called out of one bunch of people, out of one motley crew, and put into another motley crew. They have been born again. They have a new identity. They belong to a new nation. Things have changed for them. They've passed from darkness into life. When Paul wanted to describe what it means to be a Christian, he put it like this. He said, if any man is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's his definition of Christianity. 
If any man be in Christ, he becomes a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So I address you as saints because I presume that you are those who have been brought out of the darkness and into the light. And if you're not, or if you're still in the shadows, well, I'll, I'll call you saints anyway in promise of better days for you, maybe, that lie up ahead. Saints means that we're his. That's what a saint means. It means that he's, we're his. So here's, here's my title. Some people like titles for messages. So here's one. See if you can remember this. Here's my title. His. His. That's what I'm going to speak about this morning. His. And if you read the letter to the Ephesians, you'll find how often this word his keeps coming through. I'm going to read a few verses and I'm going to emphasize each time I get to the his, just so that you can hear what I'm saying. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sins, as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And then he begins like this. To the praise of the glory of his grace. This letter is all to the praise of the glory of his grace. God does wonderful things in lives. He really does transform them. But unless when we give thanks... We give praise to the grace, the God who gave the grace, who made that possible. We're missing the purpose of this object lesson. God does wonderful things in lives. And I was thinking when our brother was sharing earlier on this morning, I've discovered something over many years that God has an amazing ability to do something. It's like this. I do go from place to place, and I've preached in quite a few places over the years, and I, I get involved in conversations, and fairly frequently I have the experience when someone will come to me and they'll say, we were talking about this and this and this, and they'll start a conversation, and I think, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea who you are. And they've just started the conversation as though it never started, stopped. And I, I, you bluff for a little bit, and you, you wait, and then you get some clues, and you think, oh, yeah, I know who you are. Yes, I know what we're talking about now. But God has an amazing capacity to restart conversations that you thought had finished decades ago. He does. He can come to a life and begin to speak into that life, and that life begins to respond to him, and then something happens. Perhaps they decide they don't want to go any farther forward with this. They want to go back. And they vanish. We have a man in our church in Bracknell. <clears throat> he was the son of an Elim pastor. And he was raised as an Elim pastor's son. And he was in the Sunday school and in the young people's Bible class. And he knew all the hymns and the choruses. And when he got into his teens, he kicked over the traces and broke loose. And he went away and he began to kind of drink and he began to do other things too and he got himself involved and he got himself married and then divorced and then married again and his son grew up and he began to do the same kind of thing. And then without any warning, without any possible links as far as we can see him, can see them, he said to me, he said, and he came calling. That was his phrase. He said, God came calling. He began to speak to me. I began to remember hymns that I'd learned as a boy. I began to remember choruses, and they spoke to me. And he began to come along to the church. And God restarted a conversation that he thought had finished 40 years ago. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. I can remember, brother, being in Romania the first time I was in Romania. And I went to um, a, a big baptism in a place called Fagarash, I think it was called. And um, they were baptizing lots of people. And they were, they, there were so many of them that really what they were doing is they were just giving a very simple testimony 
And it went something like this. And they would say, um, um, have, you, have you come to, your, to Jesus as your Savior confessing your sins? And they would say, yes. And then they would say, and how long are you going to serve him? And then through interpretation, I understood that they got two answers to this question. One was until death. And the other one was forever. And they were baptizing these people one by one as they made their commitment to follow Jesus Christ, whatever the cost. And they were just about to baptize one man. And the, one of the deacons in the church kind of stood up and he said, I, I want to say something. And he put his hand on this man's shoulder who was standing in the water at the baptismal pool. And he put his hand on his shoulder and he says, this is my neighbor. <laughs> I've been praying for him for 40 years. Don't give up. Don't give up. God has a way of being able to start conversations that you thought were dead and done years ago. I wonder sometimes, this is just sheer speculation, but I wonder, you know, when you get older, and we're, we're getting there, I shall be 80 next month, <laughs> so we're getting there, um, but you, you begin to forget things like what I had for breakfast, but you can remember minute details of things that happened when you were younger. And I just speculated and I thought, I wonder whether this is God bringing to our memory things that he's spoken to us at times in the past and giving us one last chance when our faculties are still working properly to respond to him. He never gives up. And sometimes people go into a far country, you know the old story, some people go into a far country and they lost to sight and their family don't know where they are, and nobody knows where they are, but God knows where they are. And then God, in his mercy, will often give them a moment's respite. He came to himself, the Bible says, doesn't it? Just a moment's sanity in the middle of his reckless slide into utter destruction. He's sitting with the pigs, thinking how good their food looks, ready to dip in and make a start. And the Bible says, and he came to himself. And he said, in my father's house, there are servants who are better fed than this. I'll arise. And I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, I've sinned. This is a wonderful story, because it's got all the steps in it. First of all, God speaks. Then he recognizes God speaking to him. And then he decides that he will do something about it. He says, I will arise and I'll go to my father. So he's going to get up. It doesn't matter how beaten he feels. He's going to stand upon his feet and he's going to reverse his journey. He's going to repent. He's going to go back to the last time he heard his father's voice. He's going back. And the amazing thing is, you know how this story runs. It's one of the best known stories in the world, I would think. But the Bible tells us that when he was a great way off, his father was standing in the doorway and the threshold of the house and he sees him and he runs to him. <laughs> and he doesn't say, it's good to have you back. We'll just get you washed down and then you can come in and have something to eat. He embraces him. He falls on his neck. He kisses him. I remember reading of a preacher once and he described this moment with an amazing little phrase and he just said, Genuine love can recognize genuine repentance a long way off. You think about it. Often people don't have genuine love. And like the elder son, they're not, they don't care whether he comes home or not. Well, they might have the right words. But genuine love can recognize genuine repentance a long way off. And what may seem the tiniest step to you just a decision to say, I'm not going to sit where I am any longer. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go home. It's enough. It's enough. The first step of the journey is enough. God recognizes repentance and he will add grace to grace and bring you to himself. You don't need to be away from home any longer. I'm not getting very well, on very well with this. I'm supposed to be preaching this morning. Um, anyway, that's the his. Listen, us again. Uh, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted 
in the beloved. Grace. What's grace? Well, justice is when you get what you deserve, okay? And mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Yes? Well, grace is when you get what you could never deserve. I'll say it again. Justice is when you get what you deserve. Mercy is when you get what you don't deserve. But grace is when you get what you could never deserve. You ladies, there's an advertisement that comes on the TV from time to time which has a punchline which says, L'Oreal, because you're worth it. <laughs> yes? Well, the next time it comes on, you reply to it and say, Grace, because I'm not worthy. Grace, because I don't deserve it. Grace, because this is God's choice to love me in spite of, not because of. This is grace. And each one who comes to Christ and walks in his way and knows the transforming power of his spirit will become a testimony not to their own steadfastness or resolution or strength of will or good character. They'll become a testimony to the grace of God. Did you notice of that crowd that we see in the book of the Revelation? And they're all singing, worthy is the lamb. <laughs> and not, nobody is saying, aren't they wonderful people? Don't they sing nicely? And they're such faithful people. You know, they were such kind neighbors to me. Every eye is fixed upon the one they're praising. To the praise of the glory of his grace. That's why you're still here. You could have just taken you straight home. But that's why you're here. You're here to be to the praise of the glory of his grace. So that in you... Men and women will begin to see wonderful things and begin to ask questions. That's how the day of Pentecost started, with a question. What does this mean, they said? The people? God wants to enable us and live in our lives by the power of his spirit so that your neighbor says about you, what meaneth this? What does this, what does this life mean? What is the significance? How is this person able to live like this? How are they able to be so forgiving? How are they able to be so kind when I've been so rude to them? To live a life that's extraordinary. To the praise of the glory of his grace. And that's what I really want to talk about, if I can get started. (laughs) Um, Yes. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted. This is is Paul. He's, He's declaring some truth, absolute categoric truth. And then he says, and you. Because this this isn't a lecture he's giving here. This is him communicating to people. And he knows that they have experienced what he has experienced. He knows they have common ground. And he knows what's happened to him has happened to them. So he says this. In him you also trusted, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Uh, You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So these people were on Paul's prayer list and you're now going to listen to the things that he was praying for. How do you pray for people? Well, listen to what Paul is praying for. I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here's the general title. 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of him. You may have the word knowledge. It's a word which really means the, the genuine article, the real thing. That you see something and you think, yes, that's it. So he says he wants God to continue to give to them that spirit of revelation, that spirit of understanding. He wants the eyes of their hearts to be opened. Did you know your heart had eyes? Even your new heart has eyes. And you, as they used to sing to the children, little eyes, watch what you look, watch little ears, listen. Do you know that chorus? You have to be really old to know that one. (laughs) Okay. And he goes on to say this. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know. And now he's got three things. Paul often has three things. Um, He says here that you may know first the hope of your calling. Now, brothers and sisters, do you know the hope of your calling? Do you know what you were called for? Do you know what the purpose is? Not just of your old life, but of your new life. Do you know the hope of your calling? And I I don't think Paul is thinking in terms of identifying ministries or giftings or anything like that. This is more general than that. What is your calling? What, what What does God want of me? What does God expect of me? What has God... What's his vision statement for me? And how is he going to work his way through the mission statements, the bits and parts of it? How is he going to do that? Well, you'll hear God's mission statement for the human race right in the first pages of the Bible. When God says this, let us make man in our likeness and in our image. That's God's vision statement for you. And you say, oh, help. Help. I'm a million miles away from this. A million miles away from this. But God doesn't change his mind about these kind of things. So he says, this is your calling. And it comes through often in the scriptures. It comes through when, in the times, for example, in Romans chapter 8, those famous verses which says that to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose, he causes all things to work together for good. And then he says, he speaks about predestination. He says, they're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. If you're a child of God, you are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Shall I simplify it for you? You're called to be just like Jesus. That's why he gave you a new life. He wants to live it in you. Because there's no chance that you would live it without him. That's your calling. It's really important to know what our calling is. I remember one of my children at school, they used to go to Mosley C of E school. And one of them kind of came back from school, round about the Christmas holidays time, with a little letter from school. And it said, dear parent, you'll be pleased to know that um, we have chosen your child to take part in our Christmas festivities. And of course, all parents are very proud of their children. We thought, well, naturally so. I'm glad you recognized his talents and you know which family he belongs to. And I turned over it and it said, he's going to be a mouse. (laughs) It's important to know what you're called for, isn't it? Okay, well, you were called. You were called. And when God called you, he had a plan in mind that you should be conformed to the image of his son. And Paul is praying that they'll know it. He's praying that somehow in everything else that they do, they will understand that overarching all this, over over everything, is this God's determination to make this creature that he calls man and woman to be in the image and likeness of God. Let me go on a little bit because our time's going. That's number one. You, that you may know, that you may see, you may perceive it, you get a grip on what is the hope of your calling. I'm glad it speaks about the hope. Do you remember in Romans chapter 3, 
Paul has been going through and proving that the whole world is guilty, whether they're Jew, Gentile, whatever they are, they're guilty. And then he sums up with this little phrase and he says, For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's it. We'd, we'd blown it. Our mission, failure, utter failure. Now he's become identified with another spirit that's in opposition and rebellion against God. He can never be now what God intended him to be. It looks as though Satan's plan has worked and God's plan has not worked at all. That's what it looks like. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You and I are nothing like what we were intended to be. Quickly tell you. There's a, there's a story by a man named C.S. Lewis. He wrote some books, science fiction books. And uh, in the, one of the science fiction books, a man from Earth, whose name is Ransom, uh, goes to Venus. And he arrives there just at the time of their creation, when the new land has been put down and the new animals are coming and they've got a king and a queen. Um, but they've also got an invader who's arrived in their land a man who's come to defeat God's purposes and to corrupt this couple. And I won't go into all the, all the story, it's a bit complicated. But at the end of it, this man from earth, named Ransom, has been part of God's answer and the enemy is defeated. And they have this wonderful celebration with everyone kind of singing and dancing. And the king, the Adam, if you like, of Venus, and the queen, the Eve of Venus, they're standing there on a raised plinth and everyone is watching them and cheering them. And they see this man from, Ran from Earth whose name is Ransom and they say, come up, we want you to come and share, let people see, you know, what you've done for us. And C.S. Lewis puts these words into the mouths of this, Ran this man named Ransom and he says, he says to this Adam and Eve of Venus, he says, don't raise me up. Let me lie here. I've never seen a real man or a real woman before. I've lived all my life among shadows and broken images. You and I have never seen a real man or a real woman. We've lived all our lives among shadows and broken images. With one single exception. <laughs> who was in the image and likeness of God. Our Lord Jesus, in him we see man as God intended him to be. He became a real man, you know. He didn't come dressed up as a man. He became a real man. And he lived his life on earth as a real man. Not with supernatural powers that had got tucked up his sleeves, but one who was dependent upon God. One who would say, without him I can do nothing. Say, so we have seen one. Let's go on a little bit. Okay. And he says this, um, and what is the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Here's numbers two. He wants you to see, first of all, what God's purpose is in you, what your calling is. And the second one is, he wants to see, as he says here, um, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Not the riches of your inheritance in him. He wants you to see the riches of his inheritance in you. In Psalm 2, there's a conversation in heaven between the Father and the Son. And it comes through like this, and the Son has this testimony. He says, the Lord has said to me, sit until I make your enemies your footstool. And then he says this, ask of me, and I will give you the Gentiles for your inheritance. You see, when God brought you to himself, he gave you to his son. You're his. He put his name upon you. And he said, this is mine. He sealed you with his spirit and said, this is mine. I put my name on books. Hopefully that maybe they'll be returned when the person who borrows them has read them. It doesn't always work. But God puts the name of his son upon us. He identifies us. He seals us. It's like a signet ring. And he says, this is mine. 
He says it to the powers and principalities. He says it to angels, good and bad. He says it to all. This is mine. When we pray for our sick, we call over them the name of the Lord. And we're saying, this is mine. This does not belong to the enemy. This body has the flag of possession of Jesus Christ on it. It's his. It's his. If you have come to him and known the sealing of his spirit, brother, sister, you're his. And whatever trial he may trust you with. Do you like the way I said that? I didn't say whatever trial happens to you. I said whatever trial he may trust you with, remember you're his. He's not abandoned you. There never was a God-forsaken man in the whole of history except on a cross at Calvary. And he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he was there for you and for me. And no matter what trial he trusts you with, you'll never need to say, I'm forsaken. You'll never be left derelict. He'll always be with you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then this one, and this is where we link into resurrection. Here's number three. So number one is that they, well, that you, you give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your heart being enlightened that you may know what. First is <clears throat> the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is, I'm tempted to read it wrongly, what is the greatness, no, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, God's power towards us to make this vision not just a fantasy but a reality. We can't do this in our own energy. We don't do this through our own self-discipline. It's God who makes this possible. It's the coming of his spirit, his, him taking up his residence in our lives. And Paul expresses it like this and he describes this power of God, and he says like this, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. What Paul is telling us here is that the power that God will employ to transform you and me into the image of his son is nothing less than the resurrection power with which he raised his son from the dead. Now, I'm not going to be gory and I'm not going to be kind of uh, try to be sad, but that body that was put into that tomb was dead, absolutely dead. There was no trace of life in it. All the bones were out of joint. He'd been pierced in his hands and his feet. He couldn't walk where he wanted to go. He couldn't do what he wanted to do. His tongue was stuck to the roof of his mouth. He couldn't say what he wanted to say. He was utterly helpless. And then he was pierced with a soldier's lance. And they took down the lifeless body and they put it in a tomb. And it lay there for three days, absolutely dead. And God raised it. And not just to life, but he raised it to his own right hand in the heavenlies. Sat him by his own side in the heavenly places. And Paul says, the power that did that is the power that will change you. It's resurrection life. As our brother prayed earlier on, some people who were raised to life ultimately died. But there's a difference between being raised to life and resurrection because resurrection has no end to it. Resurrection, <laughs> resur resurrection is irresistible. It cannot be held down. There's a spirit that will not give up and if he's in you and you let him, he will lead you step by step into this ever increasing conformity to Jesus Christ. And if you say, 
you don't know me. You don't know my family. You don't know my father. You ought to have seen what my grandfather was like. I, we've been like this in our family for generations. He can change you. He can change you by resurrection life. He can put a spirit in you which will change everything. This is how it was all promised. Someone quoted it earlier on this morning as they prayed. A new covenant, says Ezekiel. Well, he calls it, a, and he says, that God is going to give you uh, a new heart. He's going to give you a new spirit. He's going to take the old heart out. He's going to put a new heart in. That's a replacement heart. Not an additional heart. It's a replacement. He's going to take the, hold, the old heart out. He's going to put the new heart in. He's going to give you a new spirit. And he's going to put his spirit within you. That's why we're temples of the living God. We become God's habitation by the Spirit. Isn't this a wonderful gospel? <laughs> I think it is. And I pray God will give me the strength to preach it till my last breath. Um, and you too. I'm going to pray. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Lord Jesus, we... As in our imagination, Lord, just briefly we, we think of what you've done for us. We think of that, that cup that you took and drank to its bitterest dregs. We thank you, thank you for that baptism into our death and lifelessness which you received. We thank you that you brought it all to an end and cried it's finished. And we thank you, Lord, for resurrection morning. We thank you, Lord, for the newness of it all. We thank you that you're alive. And by your spirit, you've come, Lord, to fulfill your purpose for which you laid down your life. That as the seed, so the fruit should be. That we would reproduce your life on earth. Not for our own aggrandizement or glory but to the glory of your grace we do thank you Lord for grace the power to be what we can never be for grace the gift Lord that we could never deserve we thank you Lord and we pray that as we think on these things you'll encourage us Lord to come to you claiming nothing <laughs> Promising very little, but just simply coming and saying, Lord, I trust you. Lord, let your will be done in me on this little bit of earth that I'm standing on. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.